The United Nations Children's Fund, representative in Nigeria, has urged the federal and state governments to enhance their judicial systems to ensure proper prosecution of bandits for their various crimes before the courts of law. UNICEF's representative, Kristen Mudoet, stated this while addressing newsmen in May degree on Friday in preparation for the commemoration of World Humanitarian Day on Saturday, August 19. Mundret lamented the absence of proper prosecution and punishment for bandits for the various crimes they perpetrate against humanity. According to the UN representative, it scares her that bandits are not taken to courts even though they have been assaulting and killing children and women, abducting and raping them. She adds that no laws are applied to prosecute and punish these people, urging that there must be legal process for proper punishment for them. To discuss this further, we are joined on the news by legal practitioner, writer and global affairs analyst, Raymond Nkanebe. Good to see you again, Raymond. Thanks for giving us your time. UNICEF wants bandits prosecuted, citing various crimes they committed, including killing of women and children. Are you in agreement with this? Yeah, good evening, Cynthia, and thank you for having me. Um, Yes, I read the statement of the UNICEF representative in Nigeria. And um, of course, what he has said is not different from what other persons have been saying. Um, on a larger scale, bandits are not totally different from other class of criminals operating within the Nigerian state. And to the extent that Nigeria is a country under laws and where certain offenses have been prescribed under, uh, um, under uh, several laws, those who, who are found wanting for having um, uh, 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 um, infracted these statutory codes should be liable to face uh, the criminal justice system. Uh, having said that, um, the, the peculiar issue with the bandits is not just that they are not being prosecuted. I think it is too sweeping to suggest that they are not being prosecuted. What I think is the problem here is that um, the, the, the level of reportage of the prosecution of some of these bandits has not been uh, has not been the best of it because I, I recall that um, sometime last year and even in some in previous years we have had uh, instances of where some of these bandits are being uh, prosecuted uh, or arraigned in court. But after their arraignment, nobody tries to follow up with the progress of these matters in the law court. So, uh, except someone is is not watching seriously, it may come off as though. Some of these uh, uh, bandits are allowed to go country without uh, the, the, the long arm of the law uh, being applied against them. Let, let's look at a, a scenario. Uh, some people suggest that some of these individuals who get into acts of terrorism and banditry were forced. At least some of the reformed bandits we know um, have been said to have reported that that's what happened and some of them that are repentant have been incorporated into um, our security architecture. That's what we hear. Um, what's your yeah. thinking about this repentance and, you know, maybe uh, charging those who are innocent? Uh, so, um, let, I think, let me take it uh, in twofold. So, on the one hand, uh, we have different forms of uh, uh, of of penology. Penology in, in the context of criminal law is what is the appropriate punishment for criminal behavior. And so there are several schools of thought who have said, there are some who have the view that if someone has committed an offense, you don't have to, uh, uh, you don't have to punish them. Some people have the view that you can actually repair persons who have committed, um, they, they see crime as an asocial behavior. So if people are involved in this act, they try to find out what is responsible for this and how can they be repair to become members of the society. So this is what we call, what is called retri, uh, restorative justice. They are trying to see how they can repair uh, uh, criminals. So within that context, I think um, the conversation around rehabilitation of bandits and other criminal elements in the country may be, may be justified. And if uh, that is being done and some of them are able to be repatriated back into the uh, nation's uh, security architecture, and I think it will be a win-win situation both for the um, repentant or uh, repentant um, uh, uh, criminals and also the, the, the country itself, which finds himself um, in a serious case of uh, limited uh, uh, manpower uh, in terms of our security uh, forces. 
So, so I think it's not totally a bad idea to advocate for uh, rehabilitation of some of these criminals and finding a way to um, make them useful to the Nigerian state, either providing uh, civil uh, security assistance to the, uh, to the Nigerian military or even fully being incorporated into uh, the, the security forces to the extent that only those who are able to pass the parameters of this rehabilitation uh, will be qualified or be, so will be qualified in. for this. Um, yes. Yeah. All right, uh, let's spare a moment for humanitarian workers because the call on the government is ahead of the commemoration of World Humanitarian Day, which happens tomorrow, to honor our humanitarians around the world who strive to meet our ever-growing global needs. They risk their lives every day. How can governments and people make their work a little easier? Okay, yes, so thank you very much. Uh, I think I have a personal experience with it because um, you may not have known that I also schooled at the University of Meduguri and um, in, the heat, in the heat of the Boko Haram insurgency. And after graduating from that town, some of my friends are still there are acting as aid workers uh, uh, with the several uh, international humanitarian organizations. And they have had to tell me the risk that they go through while trying to provide some of these social services. Uh, so it is clear uh, nobody can deny the fact that they take a whole lot of risk in order to assist some of these disadvantaged uh, members of our population and communities. So what can governments do about this? Um, I think if the, the, the federal government does um, uh, appointed the, the its ministers, and I think as a minister for humanitarian affairs, and and I think within the context of that of that ministry, uh, we can we begin to look at the possibility of creating. A humanitarian fund, a humanitarian um, a fund that will be dedicated to um, cater to a sort of a, a social safety fund to cater to the interests of um, persons who are involved in some of these care services in this difficult part of the country, so that it gives them that sense of security. So that in the event they lose their life, nobody prays for that, but it's an eventuality. In the event that happens, government can draw from this fund to um, sort of pay back something to members of their family. Those of them who already have family, help them to see them through school. Uh, you know, some sort of uh, uh, security to motivate other persons to uh, volunteer themselves for this very, very uh, uh, difficult job they are doing. I guess I'll just say happy World Humanitarian Day to all uh, humanitarians out there. God bless you for the work that you do. Thank you as well, Ramon Dekanebe, for giving us your time. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia.